Welcome to the special edition of Hannity, Trump versus the left. I'm Janine Pirro in tonight for Sean. From day one, President Trump has never been afraid to call out biased members of the press when they distort his record or report fake news. And during a rally last night in Pennsylvania, the president once again stood up to those in the media who want nothing more than to see him fail. Take a look. I met with NATO. Now, NATO, in all fairness, 29 countries, including us, NATO has been ripping us. We've been defending Europe, and they're not paying their bills. So I went in, and I said, folks, you got to pay up. You're delinquent. So I said to my wife, you know, I just raised like a couple of hundred billion dollars, and it was like so easy. It was so easy. I said, Honey, wait till you see the press I get on this. It's gonna be <laughs> gonna be great. And here's what the fake news said, largely. They said Donald Trump, our president, was extremely rude to presidents and prime ministers, and in a couple of cases, dictators, but that's all right. <laughs> that Donald Trump was very rude. They don't talk about the money I raised. I was rude, and I wasn't. Actually, I have a better relationship with every one of them than any other president has had. I was asked to have tea with the queen, who is incredible, by the way. So I was about 15 minutes early, and I'm waiting with my wife, and that's fine. Hey, it's the queen, right? We can wait. We then go up, and we have tea. And I didn't know this, it was supposed to last for 15 minutes, but it lasted for like an hour because we got along. We got along. So here was the story by the fake news. The president was 15 minutes late for the queen. Wrong. And then here's the rest of the story. No, here's the rest. Here's the rest of the story. So I, they said I was late when I was actually early. Number one. Number two. I guess the meeting was scheduled for 15 minutes, and it lasted for almost an hour. The president overstayed. <laughs> but they can make anything bad, because they are the fake, fake, disgusting news. As you might imagine, the very thin-skinned media in this country does not take well to criticism. And over the last 24 hours, they lashed out against President Trump and his allies. Take a look. I know that the dangerous, blustering bigot on the stage last night is even more boorish and less connected to reality than he was 10 years ago. Donald Trump is not well, and everyone close to him says it that your, your president announced his campaign by talking my, about building a wall to keep he's our president, your president Angela. keeping he's the, no he's not mine not mine United I'll never oh, I will never you... claim a bigot ever the same bigots who are bringing who are sending people back away from their children are the ones who brought my ancestors here on well, the then, then where congratulations I mean, if he's, if... that speech the president gave in Pennsylvania there were children behind him I saw at least three children two twin girls I can't get those kids out of my mind and I hope those people do more than just listen to him at a rally because their president our president stood up there and lied and I can only hope those Americans have access to the truth because that's not what the president gave them at that rally. President Trump is acting like a ship's captain in a typhoon. There's something nervous in all this, an edge of fear not seen in the American White House since the last dark, dank dog days of Watergate. While many in the media push anti-Trump vitriol every day, White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders was quick to remind them what happens when the language of the left spins out of control. Watch. The media has attacked me personally on a number of occasions, including your own network, said I should be harassed as a life sentence, that I should be choked. ICE officials are not welcomed in their place of worship and personal information is shared on the Internet. When I was hosted by the Correspondents Association, of which almost all of you are members of, you brought a comedian up to attack my appearance and call me a traitor to my own gender. In fact, as I know, um, I'm, as far as I know, I'm the first press secretary in the history of the United States that's required to 
Secret Service protection. The media continues to ratchet up the verbal assault against the president and everyone in this administration. And certainly we have a role to play, but the media has a role to play for the discourse in this country as well. Naturally, those comments from Sanders were met with even more resentment. Watch this. She says she speaks on behalf of the president. He's made his comments clear. His comment has been time and again that the press is the enemy of the people. Even in these times, an extraordinary moment when the White House press secretary will not say that the working press is not the enemy of the people. It's pernicious. It's dangerous. It is, and this is not media elite people defending media elite people. It's simply a Stalinist phrase, for God's sake. Uh, it comes out of right. totalitarian regimes to declare that a free press is the enemy of, of, of the people. And if you think that's bad, it's even worse at some of America's biggest newspapers. May I introduce you to the next editorial board member of the New York Times, Sarah Jong. In 2015, she tweeted, quote, I was equating Trump to Hitler before it was cool. She also lashed out against white people, tweeting, quote, hashtag cancel white people. And, quote, are white people genetically predisposed to burn faster in the sun, thus logically being only fit to live underground like groveling goblins? She also tweeted out her hatred for police, writing, quote, bleep the police, and cops are bleep. The New York Times just defended hiring that person. Meanwhile, the very worst example of media bias this week is something called bias of omission. For example, CNN spent less than a minute covering the ceremony where Vice President Pence received the purported remains of fallen American servicemen who died during the Korean War. MSNBC didn't cover it at all. The mainstream media is also happy to largely ignore the president's soaring new approval rating. They're also playing down America's record-setting economy. The unemployment rate is now an incredibly low 3.9%. Joining us now with more is counselor to the president, Kellyanne Conway. Good evening, Kellyanne. Good evening. Thank you for having me. And congratulations on your bestseller book. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Kellyanne. Listen, um, what we heard when the, the, over the last couple days was stunning enough. But the reaction by the press to Sarah Sanders and the reaction by the press when they are now saying that everyone close to the president knows that he's not well, like Mika Brzezinski, and the claim that the president is not well by Chris Matthews. Um, do they really think those 10,000 people cheering in Pennsylvania and Wilkes Fair were stupid and couldn't figure out if this president were smart with the program or not with the program? Well, that's the thing, Judge. All across the country, and I travel frequently on behalf of the White House, and you see the president out in the hustings quite a bit now. He'll go to his third rally this week tomorrow in Ohio. Right. He was in Florida and Pennsylvania already this week. And he does that for a very specific reason. He takes the case directly to the people, cuts out the middleman, and let's face it, the middleman doesn't like it. Cuts out the middleman when he communicates with all of us at the very same time what's on his mind at any given moment through his vast social media platform cuts out the middleman. And I don't want to lose sight of how much affection and appreciation there is in this country for this president and his policies. Yeah. People know they feel and they're living exactly what you just said, a booming economy. The predictions were doom, the reality is boom. And people know it. I went through the crowd last night in Pennsylvania. They are there because they are appreciative of having options in this job market. They're appreciative of having more money in their pockets and their bank accounts. It gives them freedom and confidence and buoyancy. And it won't matter who tells them that that's not the truth. If they see it in their 401ks, they see it in their paychecks, they see it in their home values. Uh, the other thing is, I know there's a lot of hand wringing about are the media biased and this, that, and the other. I mean, is the ocean wet? 
But the fact is that the bias of selectivity is the one that I've been talking about yeah. since the campaign, certainly through the transition administration, and it's this. Mm -hmm. You can look at bias coverage, but I think what's really harming America is what I refer to as incomplete coverage. The omission of all of the stories that are actually news you can use. Details and facts and figures that people need to know as Americans. So the administration and the media each have vast platforms. Ours is much bigger, frankly, which is probably also bothering some of these other folks and their ratings and their revenues. But we but, have uh, responsibilities Kelly, let me, let me, to make sure let me just people get information. You for a second. I want to interrupt And they're you. just not doing that. They're not doing it. But, you know, when you talk about what's going on in this country, I mean, forget about the media that, you know, is just totally focused against Donald Trump. And I want to I want to ask you, I want to get on another subject in so, a minute. But the animal um, uh, spirits that are going on, the instincts in this country with the economy, when the president talked about Valley Forge and the role of steel in Pennsylvania, I mean, he is he is integrating the two issues, the economy and and, you know, a patriotism. And I thought it was just brilliant the way he did it. But I, wa I want to go on to this woman with the uh, uh, New York Times who's going on the editorial board uh, of the New York Times, Sarah Jong. You know, most journalists operate under the, you know, the guidance of the editorial board. And this woman is anti-cop. Uh, anti she's anti-white. She's anti-men. Everything that she said is explosive in her tweets. And yet the, the New York Times is supporting her on their editorial board. So has the gray lady flipped her lid? What are they doing? Well, it's a little shocking that the bias with this particular writer would be so flagrant and blatant. I mean, usually they try to hide it a little bit better. I'm surprised she still has a job only because you can't say on the one hand, Janine, that this is an opinion writer. She's just expressing her opinion. On the other hand, mm -hmm. you and I can sit here with hardly even thinking about it and come up with 12, 15, 20 instances where people lost their jobs oh. over as much or frankly, less than that, less mm -hmm. than that. And everyone knows it. And I do want to shine a light in case the viewers and the listeners missed it on Mark Caputo, a writer at Politico, who I knew years ago, I used to do polling for the Miami Herald and, and the Tampa Tribune at the time. I, I knew him years ago in, in Florida as a reporter. He now reports for Politico. He referred to the Trump supporters in Florida as if you put them all together, you would have a full set of teeth. He said that. And then when people attacked him and asked him to retract that on social media, he said he doubled down on this and said, oh, did I hurt their feelings? He called them garbage, garbage people. And then he said, did I hurt the garbage people's feelings? Let me go get a fainting couch. He still yeah. has his job. It, it, so this is the level of discourse. And let me tell you something. Not everybody in the, in the media is the same. Not, every in, not everybody in the industry not. is the same. Right. But there is this, this, there is this growing sameness Mm -hmm. within what is covered and what is excluded from the coverage mm -hmm. that is harming. But it's just shocking to me that these people still have a job in what is called reporting. It's not shocking to me that the media have about a 17% approval rating. Theirs is going down, staying the same, where the presence is actually rising, as you said. And to not cover the repatriation and the Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence, meeting our fallen heroes as their remains well, came to Hawaii this week from North Korea. Uh, that is derelict of duty for anybody who calls themselves a reporter. They well, should stop yeah, talking about their themselves. Their mission, and Kelly, stop lecturing us their and start mission covering the news. is about trashing the president and trashing the people who elected him president, and that's dangerous. But when you hear it about George him, Soros it won't work coming in, in. It won't. we live through a campaign, it won't work. He, you know what? We, we prefer positive candidates in this country since 1960 all the way through 2016, with the exception of 1972. This electorate has always chosen the presidential candidate who they saw as more positive, all right. Let me ask optimistic, you. All right. and just sunny. So knowing what you know and all the stats that, that we have, and the president first term historically, his party loses midterm. What do you think is going to happen in 2018? You're the pollster here. Well, we know that, sure, we know the historic numbers. We know that uh, Obama lost 63 seats. That was a shellacking. Clinton lost 54 seats in control of the House. But they had also taken actions that were outside the mainstream. They didn't give historic tax cuts, historic deregulation, try to bring peace in dark corners around so the world. So you see it coming out differently for this president? 
Well, I do, I do, and I'll tell you, I do. Uh, we can't, the one thing that we're up against that we cannot control are 42 Republican House retirements. That's devastating. Yeah, that but is. this is a president that doesn't follow the trends. He makes new trends. He doesn't repeat history. He's made history, and he will be out there doing his level best, as will, as will the vice president. So you and think even those of us on the make team, history in the midterms? They'll be out there. All right, Kelly yeah, and Conway. Could, thanks absolutely. So and by the way, nobody's predicting. Nobody's predicting sixty loss, sixty seat losses. Have you noticed? They're yes. not doing that. And I think yeah. we'll pick up in the Senate as well and get Brett Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Kelly Ann, you got it all in. Coming up on this special edition of Hannity, Trump's legal team will reportedly decide within days whether the president will sit down for an interview with Robert Mueller. Greg Jarrett, Tom Fitton weigh in on that and more. And don't forget, be sure to pick up a copy of my new book, Liars, Leakers, and Liberals. They have it backwards. Stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to this special edition of Hannity. The left is desperate to draw out the Russia collusion hoax as long as they can because it gives them something to talk about. Rudy Giuliani told Politico the president's legal team will decide in the next 10 days whether Trump will sit down for an interview with Robert Mueller. Plus, today marks the close of day four of the Manafort trial. Joining us now live from Washington with the latest on that and more is Ellison Barber. Ellison? So for months, President Trump's legal team has gone back and forth on whether or not the president will sit down for an interview with special counsel Robert Mueller. One thing at issue for the president's legal team are the questions investigators plan to ask him. The president's personal attorney sent a letter to Mueller asking about the scope and format of an interview. Sources tell Fox News the special counsel has now responded to that letter and that Mueller agreed to have some questions answered in writing. There are new reports tonight. The special counsel team spoke with a woman known as the Manhattan Mad Adam on Wednesday. Her name is Kristen Davis. She ran a high-end prostitution ring in New York City. You might know her name because it came up during the Elliot Spitzer scandal. We reached out to the special counsel about this. They declined to comment. We're working on trying to figure out more on this in general, but according to reports, investigators are interested in Davis's ties to Trump ally Roger Stone. All of this is the president's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, finishes his fourth day before a federal judge in Virginia. Manafort's accountant testified with immunity this afternoon, and she said she falsified documents to help Manafort secure a loan and also classified income as a loan, which would lower Manafort's taxes. Manafort is facing charges related to financial fraud. He denies any wrongdoing. Manafort was, of course, indicted by special counsel Robert Mueller. But the things we usually think of when we talk about the special counsel, Russia, President Trump, those really haven't been topics at the trial, but they're certainly judge elephants in the room. Thanks so much. And joining us now with reaction is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Russia Hoax, the illicit scheme to clear Hillary Clinton and frame Donald Trump. Fox News legal analyst Greg Jarrett and Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton. Okay, um, you know, we just heard from Allison Barber, all right? And I'll start with you, Tom. Can you please tell me why Robert Mueller and the special counsel is prosecuting a case where an accountant is talking about falsified records having nothing to do with uh, Donald Trump or Russia. Well, the special counsel doesn't need to be prosecuting that case. Uh, a U.S. attorney so why could have prosecuted. He's trying to justify his existence so he can continue to be around the operation generally uh, to target President Trump. Uh, you know, the question about whether he's interviewed by Mueller is answered by the report that we just heard that he's fishing around with this madam up in New York. Uh, what an outrage. <laughs> uh, this is not what anyone signed up for. And uh, well, the Rosenstein idea that he's allowed care. to do this fishing expedition to me is an egregious abuse of justice and the rule of law. We Someone's got to rein All Mueller right. in. We know that, but Greg, Rosenstein is the one who expanded the original uh, special sure. counsel order. And I, so a few weeks ago, I said, I'm sick of talking about porn stars and hookers. <laughs> Why are we doing this? Well, it's completely abusive by both the unscrupulous Robert Mueller and his team of partisans, as well as Rod Rosenstein, 
who should have disqualified himself the yes, moment indeed. he appointed uh, Mueller. You, you can't be a witness and a prosecutor simultaneously. But the pre this just underscores that the president should not be ah, interviewed by Robert Mueller. And that is the question. Mueller. So you don't yeah. think he should? No. And here's why. Um, Mueller has charged uh, and is prosecuting Michael Flynn for lying. Even though Flynn told the truth, the FBI agents who interviewed Flynn walked out and said he was telling the truth. Mueller doesn't care about the truth. He doesn't care about justice. But He's Flynn good. pled guilty. So if the president sits down with Mueller and tells the truth, Mueller will file a report with Congress saying the president is lying. It doesn't matter okay. what Trump says. Tom Fitton. So it, but you can't indict a president, a sitting president. I mean, that is uh, that, that that is clear under the law and decisions. So what are we doing here? Well, I don't think the president should cooperate in helping Mueller write his impeachment report. Uh -huh. uh, and the Mueller operation, as Greg notes, is, is thoroughly corrupted. The whole superstructure structure of the Mueller operation has been corrupted by Strzok, by Steele, the Clinton DNC dossier, uh, Comey stealing records to get Mueller appointed, Mueller's conflicts, the partisanship of the, age, of the uh, prosecutors he has. Uh, why, and 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 for what is, is the president going to be uh, questioned? The Justice Department should protect President Trump from this continued harassment and shut Mueller down. But they're no not going to do it. No other prosecutor would be allowed to harass the president with questions about issues that he can't be indicted okay. on. This is just crazy time. All right, Greg. So uh, Tom is right uh, that, that, that the DOJ should protect the president. They're obviously not doing no. that. Okay. So the president should not sit down with Mueller. Right. There's no legal what basis. What benefit does he get? Well, I mean, from his standpoint, he feels like he's uh, innocent and unfairly persecuted. He would tell you, I don't know any Russians. I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't collude. Right. And if anybody in my campaign did, I didn't know about it. You know, when, when you're, I, I represented a few innocent people and they wanted to scream from the rooftops, I'm innocent. And that's how President Trump feels. However, as an inferior officer, Mueller has no legal right to question the president about exercising a constitutional authority to fire All somebody. Right. So if the president decides, as Rudy has said, in the next 10 days and probably nine days, uh, then what happens? Does Mueller subpoena the president and then we go right to the Mueller midterms? Mueller does not have the appetite mm -hmm. to subpoena the president because Mueller knows he'd lose in federal court. Aha. Okay. Now, Tom, I'm going to go back to you. Judicial watch. And you know I'm always complimenting you for what you do because you get stuff that Congress can't get, which makes me right. crazy since Congress right. has oversight. But but uh, we'll save that for another time. Now, new documents. Talk to me. What did you find out today in your freedom of uh, information requests? Well, the, doc the FBI just gave us heavily redacted documents. Two pages were unredacted of 70 about FBI contacts with uh, Christopher Steele, the who dossier the author dossier. who worked for Hillary. Right. They were co they, they were they were spending money on Steele. They met with him 13 times in 2016. 11 of those visits ended in cash going out to Steele, it looks like. From the FBI? And then in November, they decided they couldn't use him as a source anymore because he broke the rules by, uh, by disclosing his relationship with the FBI. Okay. And okay. we do Tom, now know, stop. even after that, they continued to use him. But... Uh, the documents are pretty devastating in that regard. Oh, okay, but so Tom, you're saying that the FBI gave Christopher Seale, the guy who got the money indirectly from Hillary Clinton and the DNC, who uh, is a British spy who then goes to Russia to have the document made, got cash from the FBI 11 times? Yes, the Obama FBI were co-funders of Christopher Steele's uh, Russia investigation you know, with Greg, the Clinton DNC campaign the operation. You know, the guy Your the book, dust. The Russia Hoax, <laughs> my book, Liars, Leakers, and Liberals, if we had had that, we could have done another chapter. Oh, sure we could. You know, it's, <laughs> Christopher Steele wrote this totally phony document that the FBI used, was not only on the payroll of Hillary Clinton, he was on the payroll of the FBI investigating seven months before the Trump 
Trump Russia collusion case was formally opened. Well, you know what? Sad commentary. Anyway, Greg Jarrett, Tom Fitton, two uh, two terrific uh, sources for us. Coming up, new numbers out today prove the Trump economy is booming, but that isn't stopping the Democrats from trying to downplay the president's successes. Austin Goolsbee, Sebastian Gorka, and Congressman Ron DeSantis and Matt Gates when we return as this special edition of Hannity, Trump versus the left continues. Our economy is soaring, our jobs are booming, factories are pouring back into our country, they're coming from all over the world. Remember when they said manufacturing is dead? Oh, it is? Well, who's going to make things? I mean, tell me. Manufacturing is dead, they said. We've added 400,000 incredible jobs. African-American, Hispanic, Asian. You have the lowest level of unemployment in the history of our country. What? How does somebody fight that, right? The women's unemployment rate, I'm sorry, women, damn it, is the lowest in only 65 years. Not history, sorry. But it's 65 years, I'm doing my best. The veteran's unemployment rate has reached the lowest level in 18 years, and that's going to go up very rapidly. More than 3.5 million Americans have been lifted off food stamps. That was Donald Trump last night in Pennsylvania touting his economic successes. And today, new economic numbers reveal the economy is booming. Just look at some of these statistics. 157,000 jobs were added in July, and the unemployment rate is down to 3.9%. Hispanic unemployment hit a new record low in July. Earlier today, President Trump tweeted about the great economic news, writing, quote, July is just the ninth month since 1970 that unemployment has fallen below 4%. Our economy has added 3.7 million jobs since I won the election. 4.1 GDP. More than 4 million people have received a pay raise due to tax reform. $400 billion brought back from overseas. Of course, the left is trying to figure out how to spin these great economic numbers for Trump, with some Democrats even claiming that workers are, quote, losing their jobs. Joining us now is the author of Why We Fight, Fox News national security strategist Sebastian Gorka and former Obama economic advisor Austin Goolsbee. Austin, you know, I want to go to you first. So, okay. Okay. So, you remember what he said to the inner city, to African Americans, what do you have to lose? And now, African American unemployment, the lowest in history. And I'm not going to repeat all the numbers. Please tell me how you're going to say Donald Trump is not a good president, at least for the economy. Well, I'm kind of surprised that you're choosing today's job number because today's job number was actually a whiff, was almost 40,000 below what was expected. Well, that's expectations. That doesn't 20%. mean it's not a plus. 157,000 is okay. Now, if we had this conversation last Friday, I would be totally on board with you that we had a great GDP jobs the growth economy number. Tanked since last Friday. I, I was just going to say something. The president should be proud of that number. Okay, Austin, I know you got a tough job tonight, but we're going to have to go after you. Okay, Sebastian, hit it. <laughs> Can't they just be happy for all Americans just for once? I mean, really, the New York Times has to hire races for its editorial board. I get it. But let's talk about the economy. Let's get back into the real world. I've just read your new book. You you know the president, you've known him a long time. He wants success for all Americans. Mm -hmm. This is what the left doesn't get. Uh, I worked for him, I took his, the job with him for one reason, because he doesn't care if you voted for him or not. You, you could have wanted Bernie to be president. You may have voted for Hillary, but he wants you to succeed. He wants yeah. you to be safe and he wants you to prosper. That's the president and the left will never believe it, Judge. Well, let me ask you this, uh, Austin. When, when the Democrats start running, and they're running now, obviously, for 2018, which is why the president has already started this push. I mean, how, how do they, do they just ignore the economy? Or do they talk about maybe ISIS is coming back? What do they say? I think what they would say is you, the numbers you quoted where you said 4 million people have gotten a raise. There's 150 million workers in the country. If you look at job creation rates, 
or wage growth. Both of those have actually slowed down in the 18 months that we've been under Donald wait Trump. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So I think they'll probably highlight those facts. Okay, uh, and, and do you think that America, I'm not going to let uh, Sebastian answer that, but do you think America agrees with uh, Nancy about that's just crumbs, it's just crumbs? Would they rather not see extra money in their paychecks? That's Austin. for you, Austin. Austin. Oh, I thought you said Sebastian. No, I no, said I'll go to Sebastian. They would like Sebastian to see more money in their paychecks. They haven't. Their corporate profits are at record levels as a share of GDP, and the wage share of the economy is the lowest that it's ever been. Okay, so let, 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 let's, get, let's get down to brass Trump tax. should emphasize that growth is fast, and the Democrats will emphasize that wages have not been going up. But they have. Go ahead, Sebastian. So, so I just want to know what Austin and his cadre say to the fact that we have the lowest minority unemployment since record keeping began. You can't spin that. You can't say, well, the growth has decelerated. Who cares, Austin? We have oil companies. Thanks, that, thanks to the unleashing it's, it's of great. the Anwar. We have today, oil but, companies but, that are giving $25,000 signing bonuses in America. That is, that is an economy unleashed how can you not be happy to see the unemployment figures how can you we have basically functional I, zero I unemployment we have more jobs available than people looking for jobs how do you spin that Austin go ahead Austin we've had a hundred and fifty months of private sector job creation the longest streak ever about 18 of those months were under Donald Trump and all the rest were under it, Barack Obama. It's Obama and it's right. great. It's Obama. I'm totally for it. The, the man who couldn't wonderful. get 3% GDP growth ever. African-Americans had the Donald worst Trump unemployment under, an, under an African-American president. Either. Say it again, Austin. Donald we're, Trump. So you're saying we don't Donald have 4.1% GDP growth rate? Donald Trump has not had growth, growth rate. rate of 3%. So what's the latest 4.1% figure? That's just fantasy. That was for one quarter. Yes. As you know, Sebastian, yeah, but you that know happened what? four different times under Barack Obama. Here's the problem, Austin. Barack Obama had us convinced that 1% GDP was the new normal. Right. Those bozos actually he, believed is, it. Now we're at 4.1%. <laughs> you want to say it's, maybe it won't last. That's completely not it correct. Guys, oh, it guys, is correct. Sebastian the, Gorka. We want nice the try. economy to grow. I'm Next Friday, for same it. time. If we can have Thank 4% you both. growth permanently, that'd be great. Okay, I'm going to hold you to it. Joining us now with more reaction are Florida Republican Congressman Ron DeSantis and Matt Gates. All right, good evening, uh, gentlemen or congressmen. I'll start with you, Ron DeSantis. All right, so you're running for governor in Florida. All kinds of great things are, be are happening with the economy and Donald Trump. So when you run in Florida, do people in Florida care about that? Oh, absolutely, Judge. I mean, we've had a good run here in Florida uh, during Rick Scott's tenure now with what the president's doing, particularly the tax reform, because, and Janine, you probably know this, uh, you will know this, and when you file your taxes in New York, by getting rid of the deduction for the high-tax states, that is going to influence a lot of people to pick up and come to Florida, particularly if you're in industries like financial services where you can be here. So I think we're primed to really capitalize off a lot of the good things the president's done. Um, and I think Florida has probably never been in a better position as long as we keep good, solid, low tax, fiscally responsible policies. All right. Congressman Matt Gates, you're from Florida also. You just heard Austin Goolsby talk about the economy as though uh, it's not going to, you know, don't believe you're lying on. You're kind of like Peter Strzok when he testified uh, before you guys in Congress. Don't believe your lying eyes. Uh, what do you say to the Democrats and how is that going to affect the 2018 election? You think the Americans are going to believe well, them? <laughs> Well, they should. If the Democrats take over Congress, the head of the Financial Services Committee will be Maxine Waters. And letting Maxine Waters anywhere near the economy is about as dumb as putting Hillary Clinton in charge of your IT department at your small business. Uh, look, right now we've got GDP growth that's doubling. We've got the fastest wage growth in 10 years. We've got home values that are rising at twice that rate. And we've had the longest consecutive streak of job growth in American history. Just saying it, Judge. It makes it so exhausting. It almost makes me tired of winning. 
<laughs> All right, and Con Congressman DeSantis, you know, one of the things when the president was talking yesterday uh, or last night in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, he talked about the fact that he got NATO to, to step up and, you know, he said to Melania as he related to the crowd, you know, I said, Melania, he said, tomorrow morning, $200 billion, they're going to love it. And, you know, the, they, they responded with, you know, he was rude to our NATO allies. Uh, in the end, this midterm election, which way is it going? Well, look, Judge, I think it should go Republicans way. I mean, you know, historically it, there's a reaction against the party in power, but I think the combination of a strong economy and the fact that the Democratic Party doesn't have any ideas, most of their uh, grassroots seem to be gravitating towards socialism, uh, like you see with Ocasio-Cortez in New York. That is not a winning strategy for places like Florida um, and other swing states. So as long as we stay on message, as long as we keep articulating an agenda, there's going to be a positive contrast for us with a Democratic Party that's exhausted of ideas. All right. And, and Matt, what about socialism? And, you know, uh, the, uh, America was stunned with the woman here, uh, Ocasio-Cortez, uh, a socialist supported. Uh, and I'm not sure she's willing to fully admit that, but uh, supported by the Democrat Socialist uh, Association. Um, where are the Democrats upset with that sector of the party? Because if you're not as left as they are, then chances are, I would think that a lot of the more moderate Democrats would either not come out or vote differently. I'm not sure how to look at that. Well, Janine, the dynamic you just described is precisely why there are so many Democrats in the Rust Belt who are part of Donald Trump's winning coalition. We welcome Democrats who want more prosperity. If you want Nancy Pelosi and Maxine Waters in charge, if you want them to rob America of the successes we've enjoyed during Donald Trump's tenure, then I guess vote Democrat. But in Florida, we sure like freedom. That's probably why we're going to elect Ron DeSantis, our next governor. And we want to make sure in our state that we're poised to take advantage advantage of this roaring economy that we've created with lower taxes, deregulation, and really trusting the American people to drive their own prosperity so that we're not dependent on government for multiple generations. We become excited and, and really engineered for success okay. for the long term. Congressman DeSantis, uh, last question. Uh, Tom Fitton was just on. They now have uh, 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 evidence that uh, uh, Christopher Steele got paid uh, 11 times in cash by the FBI. What say you? Well, look, we suspected he had been paid. They didn't give us straight answers. Then we figured out he definitely was paid, and now this. So I think it further undermines the credibility of the explanations we've been giving, and it shows they knew or should have known that Steele was working on behalf of the Democratic Party and to pay him like that and then funnel it through um, to, from Bruce Orr. That's a big problem with how this yeah, whole thing was done. Yeah, but you know done. what? You know, it's about time that, that uh, Rod Rosenstein and his gang and the rest of them are made accountable. But who knows if that'll ever happen. Thank you, Congressman. And coming up, the midterm election is less than 100 days away. Our Democrats Democrats going too far to the left and to secure votes. Doug Schoen and Deneen Borelli are next. And remember, you can get a copy of my new book, Liars, Leakers, and Liberals, wherever books are sold. We'll be right back. You know who the new star, you know who the new leader is? Maxine Waters. Very low IQ, low IQ. No, no, Maxine Waters is like, she's like their new star. Welcome back to this special edition of Hannity. That was President Trump last night revealing who he thinks is the new leader of the Democratic Party. Is the far left going too far this midterm season? Joining us now with reaction, Fox News contributor Deneen Borelli, Fox News contributor, former Clinton pollster Doug Schoen. All right, good. I'm going to start uh, uh, with a quick question. Sure. Is Maxine the new face of the Democratic Party or the leader? Well, I hope not. I don't think she is. But candidly, with her and people like uh, Ocasio-Cortez, 
who was just nominated in a secure Democratic district. We have people who are engaging in just resistance and socialism as prominent, and I hopefully not leaders of the Democratic Party. Okay, what do you think, Deneen? Is uh, Maxine Waters a new face of the Democratic Party? She definitely is, mm -hmm. Judge, and congratulations on your new book. Oh, thank you. Uh, listen, Ma yes, Maxine's agenda has nothing to do with Americans working and, and families being well off. Her agenda really is to impeach President Trump. She says that any chance she gets, she calls the tax cuts tax scam. Okay. And let me tell you why she's doing all of this. I think the Democrats are very desperate right now. Black voters' uh, support for President Trump is on the rise, and so I they expect more of this rhetoric from All her. right. Now, just so our viewers, in case they've been under a rock, I want you to see Maxine. And with this kind of inspiration, I will go and take Trump out tonight. <laughs> Unveil the criminal activity, the unconstitutional activity of this president and his family. So I have dubbed them the uh, criminal clan a long time ago and i will fight every day until he is impeached impeach 45. this is a bunch of scumbags that's what they are those are very We're strong words organized around making money the fact that uh, he is wrapping his arms around Putin uh, while uh, Putin is continuing uh, to advance uh, into Korea Doug well, about the only thing that is true there is that if you read the front page of the Wall Street Journal today, the Russians are doing <laughs> nothing to restrain North Korea, and that's a problem. The rest of what she said is just a load of garbage, and I just think as a Democrat, I completely distance and dissociate myself from it. Okay, but unfortunately, you've got the likes of Maxine and Nancy, who both seem to be flipping their lid, and then you've got, uh, and I'll go to you with this, Deneen, and, and then you've got Ocasio-Cortez. Is the Democratic Party that has historically will win the midterms in the first term of any new president. Uh, are they so fractured that they're not going to win? I think they are very fractured. You have the likes of Maxine Waters, and then you have those who are left of the left that are running on a really a socialist agenda. And so when you look at the Trump economy, the rollback in taxes and regulations, it's a pro-growth economic environment. There are not enough people for jobs. I mean, something is really happening here in America where America's first agenda is working. All right, so Doug, you are a pollster. I am indeed. Well, talk to me about this alleged blue wave that is president precedence, I should sure. say, and uh, the Dems believe is going to happen. Well, I don't see a blue wave. I think the Democrats are ahead. The generic vote is about six or seven points, which would translate into somewhere between 23, 25, maybe 27 seats. But that's no blue wave. I would make the argument that if the Republicans get sidetracked themselves by talking about shutting down the government and don't run on the economy, then they're doing we Democrats a big favor. Talking about tax cuts for the rich unilaterally, another big favor. If they talk about the economic uh, consequences of this administration,